to talk about. Thank you, Trevor. Appreciate it. All right. So, uh, so this is just so you know, this is an unrehearsed scenario. We're doing it is, live. We're doing it live. This is uh, unusual for my talks and for things. It's going to be completely different than anything I've ever done. Uh, most of you might have seen some of my like hard drive data recovery stuff, where I disassemble hard drives, reassemble them, move head assemblies, and things like that. Um, I've been doing forensics for about 20 years, so I've also been doing them simultaneously because I kind of fix hard drives for uh, different types of cases and law firms and police and things like that that are used in cases. But I also testify and do actual forensics. And so the setup for this case, this is this is a little bit different uh, from a from a standpoint of the process that we're going to do before. Um, we're going to pretend this is a mock trial. That's that's basically what we're doing. I'm going to play three parts. And Carla's going to pay three, maybe four parts all at the same time. So it's just the two of us going to do this. Um, so let me give you the setup for what this case is and what has happened. So this, in case, because I know it's hitting video, so everybody will pick it up. This is the real transcript from this case I testified in at the beginning of this year, in January of 2017. So if anybody wants to check my work and go back and find out more about this, because this, uh, this case is the first case that I know of where we have been doing an evidentiary hearing to see if the admissibility of evidence is to accept a hard drive with mismatched MD5 hashes. Now, I don't know if everybody understands what that means exactly. Uh, everybody know what an MD5 is? Yes. So everybody in here knows what a hash is, basically. Everybody Shaw except one, the ones that MD5. It's pretty common, right? So we're good. So from this standpoint, we've got some evidence that from the original time that it was imaged to a later date, the MD5s do not match, and they no longer have original evidence. So that's really the setup for this case. And we, this was going on for 10 years. So this is the data for you to go look up. If you want to read a transcript or all the hearings, there's actually about 10 hearings before we finally get to this. Technically, it would be considered a trial, except that we had no jury at this point. It was all judge. So this would be what you'd be asking for, for the transcript material, for anything having to do with evidence with MD5 hashes. And this is, like I said, we've searched high and low all over the country. There's a lot of talk about it and MD5 hashes and what happens in a Dahlberg hearing if you have evidence that doesn't match. But we never found a case that it actually ever happened in. So this is the first that I know of. So here's what this is. This is a new case I testified in. I've been working on this case for three or four years. Um, and this testimony is from January of 2017. This case started in January of 2007. It's 10 years old. The guy who was arrested for this in January of 2007 was on house arrest for 10 years. Literally house arrest for 10 years. He was not sitting in prison, but he house arrest, as you know, basically you go to work, come home. That's it for 10 years. Uh, so the parts of some of the hearings that I'm about to show you are from 2015, and basically as the defense, we had been fighting to get access to see the evidence. As a forensics expert, it's important for me, if you're going to get a computer and you're going to make images of the hard drives, that you are then going to indict the person and put him in jail, that you are going to have to give us the evidence to review for his defense. Everybody's due a defense. No matter what the case is, you're due a defense. So that's what this was about. We actually fought to get to see the evidence for five years. You'll see that coming up here and why I'm actually talking about that. And eventually the court forced the, uh, the prosecutor to give us access. Eventually after five years of fighting and hearings, year after year after year, they said, you must give them an exact duplicate of the evidence for them to review. They have a right to it. And then this is what happened. This is a piece of the transcript from a hearing prior to the one we're going to go over. The court, the judge says, what do you mean by that? The DA says, well, I was specifically informed by the police investigator that the original images could not locate and that it was his belief that among the image files that were maintained on the server, they had attempted to swap out. When they did that, they lost the original image files and the copies they had saved in this case. And therefore, we have, we, basically, we don't have the evidence after fighting for years. They did not have the evidence, and the judge was irate. She was horrified that they had been lying to him basically for years. I mean, he says, we just found out, but all these years we had been asking about it, and we were not able to see the evidence, and then in 2015, they say, oh, we lost it. 
So this is, this is basically a statement from the defense that's basically saying, we don't know anything about this. We've, we've sent them questions about the server crash in which they've lost all the evidence and all of the indictment material, but they've refused to answer them. So like they refused to give us evidence, they refused to answer any questions about the evidence and what had happened to the evidence so that we could then use that even in a trial or in court or anything later on. So basically, they lost everything. They lost the work. The only thing that existed, uh, how many people are familiar with NCASE? So that's the only thing that existed at this point is there was a pre-report that had been done in 2007 when they imaged the drives that had the hashes for the original hard drives that were in the work they had presented from the NCASE report. And basically because they had emailed that around and given it to the defense, that was basically the only reason it survived because it didn't survive on their own equipment or any of the work. So then here's the weird part when if you don't know anything about courts and how hearings and trials and all these things happen, they actually had to get a second warrant. It turns out they had the original hard drives still locked up in their repository with a chain of evidence, supposedly, a uh, chain of custody for the evidence, and they, but they have to request a second warrant. So we actually had to have a hearing about this warrant, and it really came down to the fact that the prosecutor told the judge, I don't care what you say, judge, we have a right to get a second warrant. And so they went and got a warrant anyway, regardless of anything we were trying to question or ask them about. So they get a warrant, they make new images, and this is my affidavit in this case. After they got the new images, they didn't even admit that they had not had the same hashes, the same anything. They carried on as it had never happened. They basically re-indicted him on a new indictment and started the case all over again and said, hey, here's the evidence, and this is what we're presenting. And of course, we have the, the first report, and then the second report, and these hashes do not match. And they completely wanted to ignore the whole subject and just move on. So we called for what's called an evidentiary hearing to question the authenticity of this. And so really, that's what happened. We put this at issue in you know, what the authenticity of these things were. And then this is what actually happens. The DA actually at this point then says, Hey, Judge, I think the issue arise, arises from their expert's opinion about what a hash is. That's literally what he says. So, so, so eventually, she comes around and says, um, listen, this is a motion to exclude your evidence. And, it, and so the, the prosecutor actually says, I get it. And she says, no, for you to put up nothing. You have no evidence. You have nothing that you'll be able to present. And she goes, this is their motion. Somebody has allowed or purposely changed or altered this hard drive. There's been a motion to test and inspect this at this point for eight years. And he says, yes, I understand that, blah, blah, blah. And then the next thing he says is, the original detective that handled this case in 2007, well, he's retired now. And we want to bring him back 10 years later to talk about his report and how the evidence was handled. Basically, the premise for what they're setting up here is they want to talk about chain of custody. They really want to talk about yeah, we had these hard drives all this time, and nobody in the police did anything to these hard drives, so all we're going to present is a chain of custody about what an MD5 is. So that's the setup for this entire thing. The judge actually says, look, I, I, I feel like I should just go ahead and eliminate the evidence, but she says, no, listen, I, it would be, I should listen to Detective Cheeks. I should let you bring the detective in, and we'll talk to him and see what he says but you guys need to bring me some scientific proof as to why hashes don't matter. So that's really where that happens. So then that brings us to January of 2017. Now, what I'm going to do is Carlo here, he is going to play the witnesses. They, the police brought three witnesses to talk about MD5s. And, and understand on this day, this is a hearing, there's nobody announcing what they're going to talk about. There's no preliminary discovery or anything like that. So it's not like a normal trial where you go in and you have an idea of what the experts are going to say. We're kind of caught off guard a little bit because, in my mind, a hash is a hash. There's not an argument. It's a factual event. So it seems very straightforward to me. And so that's what we're going to go through now. I've cut the testimony down. The testimony is like 130-something pages long. Four of us testified. I cut it to 19 pages, just the good parts. So hopefully we can pull this out of what was happening. There's a lot of redundancy in trials. If you've ever testified in a trial, I've done about 30 or so so far that I've testified in, besides depositions and hundreds of other trials that I've already done. 
but these are what it looks like to testify. So I'm going to read, and this is word for word. I'm going to literally read word for word, and I'm going to, I am going to currently play the district attorney. I'm going to switch back and forth in roles. So I'm going to start out as a district attorney, and then I will move to the defense attorney, whose name is Stephen Sadow, who is one of the best lawyers I've ever met in my entire life. So he is the, the good lawyer here. So I'm going to... Uh, <laughs> I'll make sure that you get it later. He is one of the best defense attorneys. I've worked with him for 20 years, and every time I work on a case, no matter how good I get, he has always come up with some amazing things I never thought of. So, uh, And then Carlo is going to play some witnesses. So he is dude one, witness number one. So the, call, the state calls this retired uh, guy in. And so this is what it starts out with. Um, tell us who you are, please, sir. I'm witness one. So are you working right now? No, sir, I'm retired. Okay, what are you retired from? I'm retired from the Gwinnett County Police Department. <laughs> How long were you employed by the police department? 25 years. And what did you do for them immediately before you retired? I was in the computer forensics lab for the detective division. How long were you in this lab? Yes, sir, I started the lab, and uh, that was about 1998. So pick up that he says he started the forensics lab, okay? This is really important. Shit. While you were employed <laughs> from 1998 to 2009 in the forensic lab, what were your general job duties there? I assisted officers on cases that involved computers and performed computer forensic examinations to withdraw the evidence from them. Was there hardware and software that you used in order to do that? Yes, sir, there was. Did you also receive training on how to use whatever hardware and software you needed in order to do your forensic exam? Yes, sir, I did. Did that training also occur throughout the nine or ten years that you were in the computer forensic lab? Yes, sir, it did. It did. <laughs> Prior to your testimony today, have you had the opportunity to review the materials, the reports, and the things of that nature that you used to create with respect to this case? Yes, sir. Your testimony today is based upon, is that based upon the testimony from the reports you constructed back when it occurred? Correct. The report that you ended up filing, did that include a description of how you went about doing your forensic examination of the hard drives you received? <clears throat> yes, sir, it did. We take the hard drives out and photograph them. We ran a, uh, after the drives are out, we ran a post test of the computer to make sure that it was, um, the, the post, the way it would boot uh, up is a post test. Uh, and as it was running correctly, and it showed that it was a striped raid. This was my first striped raid computer that I had to deal with. It was something new to the field. From that position, forensically, you then take these two drives, we label it hard drive zero, hard drive one, which was the suspect drive one and, well, zero and one. You place it on the Fred computer, you place it in one of the positions, the reason Fred is special, it will not write to that drive. That way we ensure that we do not alter any data, we do not alter it or add to or subtract from. All you can do is read that drive, we then prepare a target drive, so I have a source drive or suspect drive and a target drive. I then put that into the FRED and the information using NK software. It makes a duplicate copy of that drive onto the target drive. You guys see where we're going with this, right? <laughs> In and my during shed. the time that you were there, is NK the software that you use to analyze the hard drive? Yes, sir. Did you receive training as far as an in case and, and its concern how to use that particular software? Yes, sir, I did. When you create an image that had an image copied, did that become your working copy? Yes, sir. Any work that you did forensically analyzing the hard drive, was that done using that image? That target, imaged target, yes. As opposed to the source? Yes, sir. We never used the source. When did you place those hard drives into evidence? I logged them in on March 8, 2007. Because raids are new technology in 2007. Right? 
Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. So, uh, all right. In the process of Encase doing its work, does it pull the information from the image hard drive now at this point into a EO1 file that you're speaking of? Yes, sir. Everybody know what an EO1 file is? No? So, you know what a DD is, right? So, when you use disk dump and you dump a copy of a hard drive, basically Encase is taking that and then adding some CRC values to each of the chunks of the image so that it can tell the the health of its own files. It's basically adding some additional material to it so that it can kind of tell the health and if you're missing a file or something else has happened. But it's still fundamentally a DD contained inside the EO1 in addition to some other material. It also allows you to break it up into chunks. So if you need to burn it onto a DVD, you can say every EO file needs to be 4.5 gigs and it'll do an EO1, EO2, EO3, EO4, even though it's off of a single much larger disk. <clears throat> so, um, is there anything that the NK software does that reports to you as an examiner the hash value of the hard drive that it is an an analyzing? Yes, sir. It produces a hash value and a verification hash value. For what? Uh, for the hard drive that you are examining at that time. And this is where, so the prosecutor starts to try to say something and the court interrupts him. The judge literally interrupts him and stops. He's aware of what has happened in the hearings up to this point. So the judge says, uh, say that again, it produces a hash value and a a verification value which should match, showing that it did it correctly. So she's paying attention to what happened to the hashes at this point. And so the DA picks back up and he goes, with respect to your report, let me ask you there is a paragraph in which you talk about this process, and what you write is that the first hard drive is identified as hard drive zero, and it was acquired and verified on 12207 with an acquisition hash and a verification hash of blah, 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 and then there's a hash value that follows. Yes, sir. Okay. What is that, the acquisition and verification hash? What does it mean? What is that particular hash value that you placed in your report? That hash value is generated by NCASE, showing that the software imaged that drive. Is that the hash value of the source drive? No, sir. That is the hash value of the source drive as interpreted by NCASE. This hash value that you remark in your report, is that hash value for the NCASE's EO1 file? Is that a fair way? to think about it, or am I incorrect? It is a hash value for all of uh, EO1, EO2, however many evidence files there were. And again, I do not know. I did not write this in the report. I don't remember the amount, the, the sector chunks of data, the size, whether it was two or four gigs at a time. Okay, so what you place in your report as the acquisition and verification hash of hard drive zero and hard drive one also in there, are those hash values then a product of the NCASE software? Yes, sir. In the course of doing what NCASE does, does it report back to you as an examiner not the hash value that is in your report, but the hash value of the source drive? No, sir. Would you expect that the hash value of the NCASE calls the acquisition and verification hash, would you expect that hash value to be the same as the hash value for the source drive? No, sir, because, well, there's uh, that algorithm that NCASE uses. It tags onto each EO evidence file. And then that, that's when the prosecutor stops. He basically rests and says, okay, fine, I'm done. And then that's when the defense attorney comes up. So now I'm playing the part. All right. Good morning, sir. Good morning. All right, I'm going to try to be very specific in my questioning. If for whatever reason I am not clear and you need more clarification, you let me know, okay? All right. Did I understand you to say... <laughs> did I understand you to say that the source, hard uh, that the source hard drive would have its own verification, its own hash? A drive has its own hash value, yes, sir. 
What was the hash value for the two hard drives that were the source hard drives? I do not know. How would one determine that the hash value, what the hash value was based on your knowledge? You would use some type of program to determine that hash value. The program I used was NCASE, but it determined the hash value of the E01 files as it rebuilt the source file. So how do you know that the E01 file that is, as in this example, is the same hash value or the same file as what is on the original source? You, you view, as you view the target drive, the working drive that you're using, that hash value is reported. And that would be the same. I mean, that's the same drive that you just copied from your source drive. We'll just talk about a source drive and one target drive, okay? The, the source drive, the source hard drive, would have its own hash value. That's what you have indicated. Yes? Yes, sir. Okay. The target drive, as I understood your testimony, would have a hash value generated by the software program that was being used. Correct? That is correct. How do you know the original hash value, the source hash value, is the same as that that is on your target hash value? Well, it, it copied, the, the program copied your source to your target, and then it checks that value. But the check is the verification hash, as you're explaining it, would be a verification of the hash generated by NCASE, correct? Correct. It would not be a verification hash that is of the value that is on the source drive. Well, I, well uh, you, you would have to talk to the folks at NCASE. That hash value and NCASE, through their classes they instructed me, that hash value showed that we made a perfect copy from the source drive to the target. So what is it in your training that says that the source hard drive hash value would be different than the target hard drive hash value? Well, because those end case, again, like I explained, I'm, it, it's, like, it's like building a train. You take... <laughs> you take a block of data from the source and you copy it to your target. And then end case adds a little bit of information to the verifying and checksums. And, and that, all that information was copied correctly. And then it goes to the next car, and you copy that chunk of information, and it adds another little bit of information on there. And so you're verifying once you build that drive again to the target drive, and that hash value was correctly copied when it rebuilt that hard drive onto the target drive. <laughs> All right, but again, I think it is fairly basic to what we're trying to get to here, and it's going to lead into a series of other questions. It sounds like what you're saying is the end case generates its own hash when it is copying the source drive, then it verifies the end case verifies its own hash value, and it is generated at the end of the process. Correct. So where along the line is the verification that the source hash value has not changed? I've never known a drive, uh, someone to ask the hash value of a drive that sits by itself such as that. Like, that's what we do in forensics every day. I mean, literally, that is the first part of the job. So, uh, every day. And he started the department. Um, anyway, day. so that's not testimony. I'm just throwing some words in there. So, uh, all right. I should. <laughs> <laughs> and how do you know if it has a different hash than the... Wait, hold on a second hash value than generated by NCASE on the target drive? Well, at that point in time, sir, that was what we used was NCASE. But how do you know the hash value of the source drive is different than the hash value generated by NCASE? I don't. <laughs> this is completely contrary to his first part of the testimony. Uh, so, <clears throat> okay, but that's one of the things that you said that it was different. You really don't know that, do you? I, I don't. I don't know. Now, using a forensic software program like Inclay, Incase, explain to us what an MD5 algorithm is. 
Whew, it's been so long since I looked at that. I just know it's an algorithm, sir. <laughs> He's not done. And if 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 I don't write them, I don't make them. They just said that checks them and uh and that verification hash was done by an algorithm. I, I have to take them at their word for that. These are the expert people. These there's three of them and this is what it's gonna Well, isn't the MD five an algorithm that is generated that is that would be using your terminology, the acquisition value? Isn't that the MD five? There's an MD five acquisition and verification. And they must be the same MD5 algorithm. Uh, however that algorithm is written, I don't know. You would have to talk to the good folks at NCASE <laughs> about that. <clears throat> that's the training. Uh, so that's at least for the purposes of the day beyond. Yeah, that, that's beyond my knowledge. Yes, sir. Well, well, well wait a minute. Uh. But you're familiar with the terminology MD5. Uh, it, it rings a bell. We've heard it before. Uh, <laughs> when you put down the acquisition hash and the verification hash for uh, here, what we've been identifying as hard drive zero and hard drive one, uh, what you understand the acquisition hash to be. And did you understand those to be MD5 hash values? Yes, sir. Okay, so here's my follow-up question. And if you know, you tell me. If you don't, you don't. S do different software programs generate different MD5 hash value algorithms? I do not know. <laughs> well, what could it be the explanation for if for you, if you had generated a hash value A and B, when you did your duplication, uh huh, why would the hash value C and D be generated for the same source hard drive when another evaluation was done? Uh, using N case, you you can use N case or X ways. Uh, well, you've got two different platforms there, two different softwares, <laughs> and I do not know. Well, I want you to assume that they generate the same MD5. I don't. I can't tell you. I don't know that. No, no, no. I want you to assume for the purposes of my question that they generate the same MD5 algorithms. Okay. What would be the explanation for the hash values done by you would be if they were different than the hash values done a second time? I do not know. The only one is that something has changed, right? It, well, if the, uh, if the algorithms are the same. <laughs> we just established that they were, but okay. The, if the algorithms are the same, that is, if they generate them the same way, the only way a hash value could be different is if something has changed on the source drive, correct? Uh, no, sir. Uh, there were probably other variables on your target drive using your machine. I, I, I don't know. Did anyone ask you before, I just did now, about these hash values and changes? Uh, no, sir. Do you know that when it was run that the original source drive was copied and then it was copied a second time that the hash values changed? Well, he mentioned that, but... Uh... Is that perjury right there? He just said a minute ago, no one mentioned it to him. Now somebody's mentioned it to him. Hey, uh, so, so, and you have no explanation for that. No, sir. The bottom line is you don't know if the source hash value generated would be the same or different than generated by in case on the target drive values, correct? Uh, yes, sir, that is correct. Which means, in my mind, immediately, that's every forensics case. Like, that's what we do. We validate the source data from, as soon as you take the hard drive off the shelf, you validate, you make sure that it's the same hash value. That means every single case this dude's working on for 25 years, whatever, uh, he had no idea what he was doing. Zero. He had no, these people's lives, these are criminal, this is a criminal case. These people's lives are in jeopardy. 
and he has no idea what that is. So, Lives so hang in the balance. <laughs> All right. So, dun, 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 dun. All right. So now I'm going to switch back. The district attorney decides. So the so, cases are real. Right. So the district the attorney's like, have been changed well, for now I need innocent. to contradict what he just said. So Scott Moulton's court. Dun, dun, dun. All right. I asked you before, but you were asked here again. So let me clarify. With respect to the changing hash value of a hard drive that was written in your report as a acquisition and verification hash of a hard drive zero, for instance, is that hash value of the source drive itself, or is that hash value the value of the end case file? Oh, that is the value of the end case file. Right. Huh? I'm the district attorney trying to get him, like, basically, that's what they were looking for. They want him to say that the end case file is the hash and not the hash of the data from the source drive. In the file. Right. That's in the file. That's in the DD image, basically. Now you're taking a DD of the, uh, you know, a hash value of the DD and text files in the same directory. Like, literally. It's like if you have a train. <laughs> right. And the hash value, would you expect that to be the same thing as the hash value of the hard drive itself? Yes, sir. And he answered that incorrectly. He contradicted himself. The hash value of the source drive itself, I mean. Oh, I, I don't know. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> right, that's where we end up with. And eventually, it's like, all right, you're retired. You're dismissed. So that was done. So literally, we made our case. They don't know. And it's over from that standpoint. So now, I'm switching back to the defense attorney. And we're calling dude two. Here's your sign. So, do two works again. <laughs> so, there was a whole introduction done by for two do two by the prosecutor, but I don't need all it was was hey, how are you? Who do you work for? That was pretty much it. Oh, I work for the police department. So, please tell us who you are, sir. My name is Second Dude. Where are you employed, sir? Uh, the Gwinnett County District Attorney's Office. Do you have any particular assignment with the DA's office? Yes. What is that? I'm currently working in the computer lab. You've done computer forensic work for the DA's office as well while you've been here? Yes. So when you went to get the tower back in September of 2009 and you were in the computer lab at the DA's office, or just an investigator. I don't know if you were just an investigator, but still an investigator. Yes, but we did have a computer lab at that point. Were you part of this computer lab? I was it. I was it. You were it. That makes a whole part of it. Yes, sir. When did the servers crash, the ones that lost the original evidence? When did the... Understand, too, at this point, for two years, they had not told us anything about the server. We sent questions. We went, we went through an entire process trying to force them to give us answers because we want to know how they handled the evidence and how it was lost and how they didn't have it. We, they answered zero questions, and they only brought this guy in because they thought he was going to answer a chain of custody question, but they opened up a can of worms. So, so the attorney, Stephen Sadow, he goes, okay, well, uh, so when did the servers at the Gwinnett County Police Department crash? Oh, geez, I couldn't tell you that. Could you give me an idea? Was it in uh, 2009, 2010, 2011, 13? Do you have any idea? I really don't. I know that they had either one crash or two, and they've gone through all three different iterations of storage for all of the data. There's multiple crashes now. Now we have some new information. When did you become aware that there could be some problems with, because of the server crash, the evidence that was lost? That would have been around 2015 as far as this case was concerned. Well, I, I don't mean about this case, just in general. In general? I, I believe the only reason that this was an issue was because of the age of this case. The images that were on the original server, like I said, I can't tell you. 
I can't even ballpark when that server went down that started storing all of their evidence files, and it was recovered. A lot of that evidence files was recovered and backed up onto another server. They didn't know that this case was still active. And we had no idea it had been recovered. As far as we knew, they had told us at this point it was crashed, and we didn't have any answers for you. We knew nothing. So they? Who is they? That would be the other guys that were working in the computer lab when the server crashed. A minute ago, he was it. He was the it. So. Uh, the computer lab in the Gwinnett County Police Department computer lab? Correct. Oh, okay. So you're saying that they did not know that this case was active. You're saying that they didn't know that this was still a case. They were working off of a list of pending cases, and they specifically targeted the data from those recovered drives to pull those evidence containers relating to those cases that they felt were still active. They didn't know that this case was still on the radar, still active. So they didn't pull the data. They didn't know to look for it. Oh, so they didn't attempt to recover the data that was on the server that crashed? They attempted to recover the data, and they did recover data. They just didn't know to look for this specific case file information to be able to pull it. So it sounds like what you're saying is that they attempted to pull all of the data that they could, but they didn't attempt to pull this specific case? Uh, well, no, that's, that's... Okay, all right, then explain. Explain it to me. Well, they pulled data. They pulled a lot of data. And as far as I know, they were able to recover all of that data. They were, they were able to recover all of the data, all 100% of the server. It turns out, actually, they had a uh, police officer there. Once I heard his name, he took my data forever forensics class. He was actually the recovery guy, and he recovered all of the data, 100% of the data. Okay? Get that. It's like, that, I know it's not what he said earlier. And it changes throughout the entire trial. So, uh, so this is after the server crashed the first time? That's my understanding. Oh, okay. So that's fine. So now they're recovering all of the data. They, they've got all this data. And now they're restoring all of this data. At this point is when they've exercised whatever discretion, judgment, process, choices of, okay, that these are the cases we're looking for that we need to put back onto this new server. And that's what happened. So they didn't take the restored data that was the data that was recovered. They didn't take this recovered data and attempt to restore that data, in this case, to another server? That's my understanding, because I'm not real sure how the information was recovered, how the data was recovered, and what the end result was. If it was just data streams, they have to go in and start looking at file header signatures or something like that to figure out, okay, this is an EO case, and there's a case number assigned to it, that they're looking at it maybe at the level to see, okay, I know this information belongs, or is this a case with information in it? And they have to estimate out how much of that data to carve out to restore to the new system. Okay, all right, so, so the recovered data... Once the server crashed, I think you said that all of the data was recovered. It was my impression that they were able to recover all of the data off the crash servers. How it was recovered, I don't know. And in what form. All right, all right, all right. All right. So, but then what happened to all of this recovered data if it wasn't restored to the server? Uh, at this point, I'm still, uh, because I don't know for sure, uh, based on what I remembered from some conversations in passing, that they then looked at the recovered data, sorted out what cases that data belonged to to restore back to the new server. And that data that wasn't restored, well, what happened to that? For all intents and purposes, it was lost. Lo lo wait, 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 wait. Lo they recovered all the data, and you're saying lost as in not really lost, but as in now, thrown away and discarded. Okay. Right? I guess. I I, I mean, it wasn't lost anymore. They recovered it. Then they decided, for whatever the reason is, that they decided not to restore all of the data to the new server. Affirmative. So whatever wasn't restored is not lost. It's now discarded, correct? That, that is my assumption. Okay. Y yes, sir. And it's your understanding that the data that would be in this case was not restored to this new server. That is my understanding. Were you aware during this whole period, we're talking about from 2007 
to say June of 2015 that there was an ongoing, in my words, uh, litigation with this case. Yes. Discussions about the defense trying to get work. Yes. But it sounds like at no point in time, at least, as far as you know, between 2007 and 2015 in June, did anyone make an attempt to determine if there was still working copies of the computer that could be obtained? That would be a fair statement. As far as my knowledge is concerned, there was never any reason to think that the evidence create. Uh, we were interchanging evidence with evidence containers. The original evidence, which would have been the computer, original hard drive that were in the computer, uh, they had a forensic copy. And when we make that copy, they work off the copy to do the examination to reach their results. This is when the judge starts to get really pissed, and the judge like interjects. She goes, "All right, all right. So, so, so now I'm the judge. So forget this time. So, uh, I'm the judge. So, in case made a forensics copy and put it into an evidence container. Yes, but that evidence container was then loaded up on a server. I believe initially in that case uh, is, is uh, they were still imaging to hard drives, and when after the examination was done either right after it was completed or in short order at some point in those images uh, that were on the hard drives, we uploaded to a server for storage so that they could recycle and reuse the hard drives that were used. Huh. Oh, so, so the physical hard drives got wiped again? Correct. <laughs> so so the, what end case would call an evidence container was then uploaded to the... To the server. To the server, server, and and that's what's gone. Yes, ma'am. And that's when she just kind of stops. She's just like, "All right, okay." Other than this particular case, I'm back to Stephen Thadow. Other than this particular case, how many other cases have you had to go back to the original source drives to obtain the evidence again? Uh, maybe a dozen over a period over the last uh, twenty twenty five years. So, so just to kind of interject at this point, and again, I'm not a lawyer, and so don't take this as legal advice or anything, but there's, a, there's some ethic violation here where they're not telling the prosecutors that they've lost maybe upwards of 300 cases, that they're basically trying to make deals and back people maybe into a corner or something to make a deal so they don't have to go do the additional work. And so they're just, that's why they delayed us for like four or five years. That ends up being part of the problem. So, uh, do you know what an MD5 is? Yes, sir. MD5 hash values are not supposed to change unless there's something done to the source drive, correct? Uh, in general, that is correct. Um, ho however, uh, well, however, go ahead. Uh, well, you're correct. Something either changed, or if you're talking about a single file level, or if you're talking about the entire media on a hard drive. Media on a hard drive. Uh, in this case, if there's a problem with a cluster, a uh, read error, or something, that there's a chance that, uh, or even a sector, uh, that the hash value when it was working versus when it was no longer readable, it would affect the hash value. Well, well that means then that the original... Uh, that means that there's something changed. <laughs> but it's not the same as the original, correct? Uh, well, it is and it isn't, okay? Uh, the image... <laughs> The image of the entire data stream has changed. The individual files that we're looking at were hashed from the first time to the second time remain the same. Just so you guys know, they didn't hash. They only hashed like 40 files. They didn't hash the rest of the files. They had no evidence, so they had nothing to look at. So, all right. So, all right. So, let me ask you this. Based on that, which cluster or what sector or what problems are there in this case? Uh, that one I couldn't tell you. Now, I will tell you, I went back and verified before they ever even, before everyone walked in that courtroom, neither program, no program, and no hard drive error ever occurred. There was no sector errors. There was no cluster. There was nothing wrong with any of the errors in the reports. Not a single sector was bad. The exact same number of sectors were included, so both of the hashes should have been equal. So is there anybody that has determined that there was a problem with a cluster uh, or, or sector. Or sector, or anything in this case. Uh, no, that's just a theory. Uh, I don't know that to be a fact. So other than your theory that the hash value should remain the same, correct? 
Uh, yes, the hash values would remain the same. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Now, the district attorney decides he wants to try to straighten this mess out again. Because, so he steps in. So. <clears throat> Are you familiar with the NK software? Mostly, yes. Are you familiar with what an EO1 is? Yes. If you were to obtain the hash value of an EO1 file, would you expect that to be the same hash as the source drive itself? Uh, no, it, it will never be the same. Which is correct, a correct statement, but it's intended to confuse the judge because now he's hashing an EO1. He's not hashing the source drive. It's not out of the EO1. So, um, why not? Uh, well, when NCASE creates the evidence file, the EO1 file, it adds additional information, such as the investigator's name, the case number. It has a CRC section for cyclical redundancy check for that file container. And so when you look at that image, uh, that container, it has more information in it than the original image that you imaged. Uh, or, or not the original image, but the original data file. So, so we're kind of okay with that whole thing. So we dismiss this witness. Everybody dismisses this witness. And we're kind of done with that witness at this point. And so we move on to witness number two. And witness three. All right. And again, it's just basically an intro by the district attorney. And so then all of a sudden, the defense attorney comes in again. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> this is funny. This last. <laughs> so using what would be X-Ways forensic software, it is, it, is it your opinion that it would generate an MD5 algorithm or hash value that is different than that one generated by NK? Uh, I don't really know what the method is in which NK generates the hash. All I know is that the way that, the, uh, that X-Ways works is that you, uh, well, it takes the hash value as it's imaging, and then once it authenticates, which is about an hour-long process, creates, it calculates another hash. And uh, then it advises you whether it is a match or not a match. These are all MD5s. Uh, these are just one after the other. So, Do you understand in that answer you say that you don't know or don't have any working knowledge of how NCASE generates a hash? Uh, oh, NCASE 4 generates a hash value. No. Well, any version of NCASE? Uh, well, they've changed dramatically. Oh, they've changed dramatically. From NCASE 4 to NCASE 7. But you have no working knowledge of how in case four generates a hash. No. <laughs> like, so how does he have anything to tell us that it's changed or it hasn't changed? So you don't know whether it generates a hash value that is the same as the source or it is somehow different or anything, correct? Well, I can only speculate, having not used the tool, <laughs> that it's doing what it should be doing. <laughs> However, one doesn't know if it's mounting that drive to the actual computer itself, and then obtaining the images that way, or if it's just imaging the source data, or these are questions that not being an ENC, uh, an NCASE examiner or certified examiner, uh, I, I really can't answer, especially with respect to the mounting. <laughs> <laughs> these, are, these are the experts put up by the... This is the police. These are literally the... Uh, okay, so... So you don't have an explanation as to why the hash values are different from 2007's examination to the source and the value in your hash values? No, I haven't done any research into it. All right, then. So, but let me get to the heart of this. According to your testimony, when did your X-Ways forensic, when you did your X-Ways forensic examination, were you able to determine the original hash values of the source drive? Yes. How can you tell us that the source hash value has changed from 2007? You can't, right? Uh, I can't without having that. Uh, if uh, I'd be able to, if 18.1, uh, if X-Ways 18.1 was, uh, well, 18.3 was used, uh, I would be able to, uh, but other than that, no. Those are all versions of X-Ways. It's just different versions of X-Ways. He's just spitting out. So you're unable to tell us whether or not the source drive, that is the source hard drives, are the same as they were in the original first C's computer. That's correct. And you didn't have, as a result of whatever training uh, that you came along, 
you can't tell us on your working knowledge of in case four and how it generates an MD5 algorithm or hash value. That's correct. So even their guys at this point basically have uh, have said they don't know think about how the source drive and the changes that they've admitted that the hashes don't don't work. So now Harlow is going to play Scott Moulton. <laughs> He's going to play me. <laughs> and this is really shortened because this was like a four-hour testimony here. Um, so now I'm going to switch to the DA. And the DA comes up and he says to me, um, it, it is your testimony that in case version 5, when it pulls out an acquisition and verification hash, that that is the target source hash value. Uh, wait a minute. When it pulls out as opposed, it is the target source hash value as opposed to the EO1 file. Yes, that correct. I didn't say that. I said correct. Yes, absolutely. correct. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, the target would be verified, the verified hash. And this is actually the court. The judge actually gets in and says, and she starts talking to me directly. And she says, the target would be the verified hash, the acquisition hash. That would be the source. Is that what you said? Yeah, it maintains that forever in the file. Uh, this is the entire point of them making the container, is that forever carrying on. Uh, if you know five years later in a case that we receive evidence from someone, the very first thing that we do is open the evidence container and run a verification. Uh, and it will tell us, okay, nothing has changed, and that file still exists exactly the same hash as it was. Uh, and forever, we can print out that report, and it will match the original report on day zero of you imaging that drive. It will always match, because I am Scott Moulton, and I'm kind of a big deal. Well, and the... And the Hello. <laughs> and, the, and the judge continued to talk to me, but then that was pretty much done. After that was done, and we basically explained that that was not an EO1, that it was, it was the actual source drive. So at this point in time, the DA has a closing argument before we're done, and he says this. He says, clearly, we have a difference of opinion about what the original hash value is in the in-case report. The court has heard testimony from two witnesses on behalf of the state that said what the hash values were. It was really three, but uh, which, is not, which is not expected to be the same as the hash value for the source drive. So the court has heard this testimony, obviously from what Mr. Moulton has said, who has a difference of opinion about what the acquisition hash means. I think that there is sufficient information for the court to admit the evidence. At the end of the day, let the jury decide. That's what he said. So we, at this point, we had to introduce a new document because obviously here I am testifying that those are not the same. So we had to introduce a new document. And so this is what we did. We got a book, and we gave it to the judge. <laughs> it's not a joke. We did this. We gave her this. We gave her this, and the first line of the glossary said, the hash values or MD5 is calculated on the acquired bitstream image and not on the EO1 file. One line from that. One line, which they testified for three hours about how it was the same as the EO1. And they were certified people. Those were actual certified people. So now, let's take it. Because the next thing was this. We finished up, and then we waited. And about a week later, the judge came up with a decision. And here is what the decision is. Based on all the foregoing, the court, based on all the foregoing, the court finds that the state acted in bad faith. That's pretty bad. That's actually like we did damage to this case. Bad faith intentionally writing over original forensic copy hard drives and then again later discarding the recovered data from the server crash when it knew the originally imaged drive had not had been wiped or destroyed and were not able to be inspected. So the defendant is extremely prejudiced by not being able to examine the original evidence originally imaged and present in this defense to each count of the indictment. Therefore, the evidence from the original hard drives and the re-imaging in 2015 is hereby excluded. And it still took them a month. They had no evidence, and it still took them a month to let the guy go. 
whole nother month for them to decide they had no evidence to present. So, so that was pretty much it from that standpoint. I hope everybody kind of got a good idea about how a trial goes. It's not exactly the comedic uh, value that we had here, although I was sitting in the back of the pews literally lapping my ass off on this. And I'm like, <laughs> how can they? I mean, I even at one point turned around and looked at the, uh, at the officers that they were going to admit, and I'm like, what is this? Like, how could that be possible that you would even say that? That is the basis for forensics, an MD5 hash. So basically, you know, I'm kind of following a the theme, think different. I think you should think different about forensics, obviously. But uh, un honestly, this is what I get asked all the time, like, what do you do in a forensic case? Sometimes it's a simple thing like this. Not that there wasn't anything complicated in this case. But hopefully you guys all enjoyed my presentation and you got something out of it from a standpoint of a trial. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Carlo.